welcome for this uh, probably last session uh, of the day. Very exciting uh, technology. I'm, I'm really pleased to be able to, to be the anchor here uh, for the next 45 minutes talking about TAVI for aortic regurgitation and, and talking about the unmet needs. So these are the two real topics that we're going to talk about on the left-hand side. The aortic valve regurgitation, different beast, different animal uh, compared to aortic stenosis, which we now know so well uh, to treat. Matter of fact, uh, us as interventional cardiologists, we were not really happy treating uh, this condition until recently. Now there is a new uh, valve for us, at least it's new, it's not, not at all new, but for us and it's become available and we'll see uh, the results and the exciting uh, game changer this uh, could possibly be for these patients. So the objectives today, to learn about the unmet need in treating aortic regurgitation, learn a little bit about the condition before we treat it, to discover the performance of the Trilogy system, uh, which is the new TAVI device for the treatment of aortic regurgitation, and to discuss the future of TAVI for aortic regurgitation. All that in 45 minutes, so we'll be quick. We've got a fantastic team. Nicolas van Miegem uh, will moderate and will in a moment ask you to interact. And then we've got Stefan Baldus, Tanja Rudolph, and Hendrik Trede uh, as discussants. We even have a chat master online, hi Mati, uh, who will answer questions uh, online. And that's the program. Uh, we'll start with Stefan Baldus talking about aortic regurgitation in 2022, where is the unmet need, and then we go on to off-label, and then finally the data treating AR with a trilogy system, and we'll have a little discussion about the future of treatment. So. Yeah, so, so thank you very much, Andreas. I think uh, in terms of moderating, Stefan. please feel free to be as interactive as possible. Obviously, we will be interacting as a panel with each other, but it would also be nice if you would have any questions or comments that we would be very happy uh, to take them and uh, to discuss them also uh, among the group. But without further ado, I think the time is right for Stefan to start the session. Stefan. Thank you, uh, Nicolas. Uh, is, is this a difficult question? Is it a dis difficult task to answer this question? Probably not. It's, uh, it's pretty clear. The data are pretty clear with respect to this question. Is there an unmet need? Well, if you look at this uh, recent publication here from the US, um, you can see that basically surgery saves lives in patients with uh, aortic regurgitation. These were all symptomatic patients hospitalized, and you can see irrespective of left ventricular function, all patients being operated on basically benefited from this in the, in the long run. And you can see here what happens to patients who are not operated on. They have a, a high um, mortality almost near to what we have experienced uh, with respect to aortic stenosis in patients not being treated. Um, and um, uh, you see here the, the, the reality in the US at least that a quarter of symptomatic patients with severe aortic regurgitation um, only received uh, uh, the equivalent uh, therapy. A large proportion of patients is simply not treated. And this goes even further um, and has impacted on our recent guidelines. Here you see data for asymptomatic patients with aortic regurgitation. And what you can see here is that um, uh, in patients, even in patients with slightly reduced systolic ejection fraction below 55% or slightly increased diameters of the left ventricle, here if, if you look at the index above 20 or 25, you see an increase in mortality. These were all patients who were operated on. However, when they were operated on too late, you can see here uh, the respective increase in mortality over a large time span. And as I said, uh, this uh, recommendation for early operation in asymptomatic patients in the current ESC guidelines was uh, in, updated um, from uh, um, 2A to 1, and there's a new indication uh, for these patients with slightly elevated uh, left ventricles. And you, you may see here that we are looking exclusively now on the left ventricular and systolic rather than end diastolic diameter because it's more sensitive to subtle changes in volume uh, overload. Um, so that these patients apparently, as I'm showing you, as I've shown you before, benefit from early intervention. 
Now, if we look at uh, the European uh, current situation, you can see here data from the uh, observational uh, study, the VHD2 survey. You can see here that uh, almost 5% of all patients being looked at out of these 5,000 patients um, collected uh, have a pure aortic regurgitation. And you can see here that in this index hospitalization, only a third of these patients actually received surgery. Um, there was uh, another fraction of patients uh, looked at who were scheduled for, but perhaps what is most worrying is that 40% of these patients were considered not to be operated on by the treating physician. So one could question whether the indication for treatment and, and the assessment of aortic regurgitation were actually, was actually um, uh, okay. And here, here are the, uh, the risk factors for not being treated. You can see here that only 15% um, uh, of females were, were treated. Um, most of the patients treated were at New York Heart Association class one and two and had preserved um, or at least uh, not significantly impaired left ventricular function. It is basically mirrored by the US uh, trial I showed you in the very beginning where they found that female gender, advanced age, and a significantly reduced systolic ejection fraction were the, the drivers for not uh, operating on these patients. So I think this very clearly shows uh, the current dilemma. We have a clear indication for early operation, even in patients with asymptomatic uh, disease, but we have only a fraction uh, of patients receiving this, uh, this therapy, and this is obviously for a purpose. These patients are too sick for conventional sur uh, surgery, and um, we have to reduce the high mortality unoperated, untreated patients have and potentially, and this is going to be the topic of, of the next couple of minutes, a transcatheter solution could here solve the problem. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. Uh, that was great data, but let me turn to the surgeon. Right? Is this all true? I mean, are, why are patients untreated? Do you see that, or do you see them coming too late? Or Yes, I think this is what we can really learn from the data. The patients are coming late or are not even presented to the surgeons uh, due to the list of comorbidities, age questions and stuff. So um, unfortunately, um, even those patients who could be operated on will not be um, presented to the surgeon at that stage um, for various reasons. So there's a clear need for a transcatheter-based solution. But at the same time, um, patient, uh, aortic regurgitation is a different animal than aortic stenosis, right? So the heart of a patient with aortic regurgitation, with severe aortic regurgitation, somehow must be different than a heart that is exposed to severe aortic stenosis. Can you, can you comment on that from a surgical perspective? Exactly. It, it much more resembles to MR than to AS, so it's a completely different animal. Um, we have this volume overload, we have the left ventricular um, uh, dysfunction in, in many patients already, and therefore we have an increased risk uh, also, and, and you cannot restore that ventricular function by just placing a valve in every patient, so that's a clear indication that we have to come earlier. Clear cut. Different animal. Do you think that guidelines are being followed, Stefan? Yeah, the, the, I, I'm, I'm, I would be hopeful, but I'm a little bit pessimistic. If we cannot offer a treatment strategy for patients who are too sick for surgery, probably the adoption um, of, of the awareness of looking at patients is not as high as we want to have this. So um, I think the treatment perspective drives being aware of uh, changes in guidelines. It's at least my, my hope. Okay, let's move on, because um, let, let's have a look at what we're doing currently. Because we want to help those patients, we want to put valves in, we do put valves into aortic stenosis patients every day, uh, but there seems to be a problem when it comes to AR. There is, and I think we are all confronted with this, and that's why we are considering to use uh, designs, TAVI designs that are designed for the treatment of degenerative aortic stenosis and use them in aortic regurgitation. And the question is, yeah, does that make sense? Well, let's see what, uh, what there is out there. Well, first of all, um, what we briefly discussed in the panel is it's a different animal. In degenerative aortic stenosis, you have these 
calcifications on the uh, aortic leaflets that make it very uh, that make opening of the valve a little bit more cumbersome. On the right hand side or in the middle, you see what happens uh, with pure aortic regurgitation. The valve leaflets themselves, they don't have any calcium. And obviously we do need the calcium in uh, TAVI for anchoring purposes, at least for current generation devices that we use for aortic stenosis. And then there are other challenges. There's also the fluoroscopic visualization of the native valve leaflets that might become more difficult because there is no calcium. And then, Obviously, there is a major issue in terms of anchoring. If there is no anchoring, then obviously there is a risk for migration and pop-outs. And this is exactly what we'll see. And unfortunately, these are illustrations from, uh, from the Erasmus back in the day. And uh, this is also the reason why we are a little bit reluctant to use, for instance, balloon expandable valves or the conventional super annular functioning uh, self-expanding uh, transcatheter valve platforms. But what do the data say? Well, first of all, there's not that much of data. And this is a little bit summarized in this slide. And you see that uh, the data is already quite old. It started in 2013. There is some data out to 2018. The number of patients are relatively uh, low. But if you then look at the endpoints, quite uh, alarming, I would say, with 30-day um, mortality uh, of more than 10% and then more than uh, moderate aortic regurgitation really out there uh, above 10%. This is definitely unacceptable for uh, Davi space as we speak today. In aortic stenosis, this would uh, definitely be uh, alarming and we would uh, really reconsider our practice if that would be uh, our quality. In this study from, or in this reg in the TVT registry, they also looked into the outcome data of patients undergoing TAVI for pure AR and compared it to the outcome of patients with um, severe aortic stenosis. And then also it becomes obvious that patients uh, in uh, for that undergo TAVI for pure aortic regurg regurgitation do worse at one year, but basically the separation of the curves is almost immediately post-procedural. And I think this attests to the fact that um, these designs were not meant to be used for severe degenerative aortic stenosis. And that also, again, uh, is resonated here in the numbers of all-cause mortality. Also, the re-intervention rate is more than 5%. And uh, again, those numbers are not acceptable in uh, contemporary aortic stenosis practice. Did we make some improvements? Probably we did, because we have, been, we have seen the introduction of new designs with a ceiling fabric and also repositionable and re uh, retrievable features. And in blue, you see what we were at achieving in terms of outcomes um, with the first or earlier generation devices. Obviously unacceptable, uh, it's getting better with the contemporary devices, but still the numbers are not what you want it to be. And uh, here is another example, and it also illustrates a concept that is be being promoted by some sites. They say, well, you know, agreed, these, these, these valves are not designed for pure AR, but why don't we use two valves? One valve to help anchor the second valve. Well, it becomes a little bit of a costly situation in that, situ uh, in that uh, context. I know, for instance, uh, a big center in Los Angeles uh, has promoted this for, uh, for a certain time. Um, well, obviously, if you use a valve and valve, you, you might end up with a good result in terms of aortic regurgitation. But uh, I think you will agree that even though you might uh, get rid of the aortic regurgitation, this is not the context that you want to, want to be in. So in conclusion, I think, again, TAVI uh, so far has been designed to treat degenerative calcific uh, tricuspid aortic stenosis, but we are using uh, the data also for pure AR, and the clinical results are variable in that context. At the same time, valve design selection is paramount, but we need uh, uh, we need de dedicated anchoring mechanisms, and I think this is where the good news comes in, because there is now a valve platform that has a totally different concept. It uses the native leaflets to anchor rather than the calcium. And that opens up, of course, a new avenue of opportunities to treat patients with pure aortic regurgitation. And that is what we're going to discuss later. Thank you. Well, OK, well, let's finish off the conventional valves, shall we? Um, uh, how often do you think that is done? 
these days? Yeah, I think it's uh, in my practice, I can comment in my practice, it's around um, two or three percent of the cases. AR. AR. Okay. But there is also a combination of moderate aortic stenosis and uh, aortic regurgitation. So you do have calcium in those uh, situations. And then yeah. the R technology works reasonably well. But for the pure ARs, which is even lower numbers, but also because our referring docs don't know that we have a treatment option or we may have a treatment option for that indication. Um, yeah, that is, that is uh, very low. And in smaller anatomies, probably you can get away sometimes with the current devices. But me, in, in my center, I, am, I, I was very happy when uh, a new technology received CE approval for AR. So in the UK, I looked it up, uh, 250 cases a year is not a lot. It's, it's certainly less than 4%, and, but the outcomes weren't, weren't great. What are criteria? Some, somebody came along to me and said, well, they all have large annuli, so the normal valves won't fit and, and probably the new ones are neither. But that's not really true. What are criteria that make us believe we can actually still maybe get away with something? How much calcium do you need? And uh, Tanya, a, what, what do Tanya? you think? Well, I think if it's really a small annulus, you could mm -hmm. also brave, be brave, and, and then you can treat it with uh, like the brave. other. <laughs> yeah, that's true. But I think, of course, we have the limitation of the annulus size. So, but if it's a small annulus, um, I mean, we have experience with that and it works out well. But um, of course, there's always this feeling that you have to be brave to treat the patient. And I think yeah. this is something which is not yeah. acceptable. And that is with the back against the wall, right? If there is no other option exactly. and the patient really has been turned down for surgery and there is a small anatomy, that is also the 2% that we do in, in Erasmus. But again, you would want to have a solution for these patients, for all the patients. So, so I think we've built up the hype now enough. Um, so we've established uh, with credibility that it's not a good idea although sometimes possible to treat pure aortic regurgitation with no calcium uh, with one of our standard valves. Um, there is a new system and Tanya Rudolf will tell us about the results. Mm -hmm. I would like, uh, first of all, to introduce uh, the Trilogy heart valve system. As you have already heard, it's a self-expanding valve uh, with uh, porcine pericardial tissue. And the special feature of this valve are the three locators uh, you actually see here on the fluoroscopy. And so this is unique, and uh, here you just see how the implantation uh, takes place uh, in this little cartoon. So these locators are dedicated to be positioned in um, every single coronary uh, sinus. And what they actually do, they clip onto the native leaflets. And this helps us uh, to seal the valve, but also to give a stable securement. And since we position the valve in, in this way, we can always be sure that it's commissural perfectly aligned, which is an additional feature which just comes with the way of implantation. And uh, in addition to that, you can nicely see that here on the right-hand side, the, the opening of the stent frame is, is quite large. So we will also not have a problem uh, if the patient is coming back with a problem in the coronaries because it will be easy to access the coronaries. And uh, so currently we have three uh, sizes available as shown here, and we can treat um, annular diameter range from 21 officially to 27. Uh, but from the experience we got from the last 50 cases, we now know that we can even go up to uh, annular diameter um, of 30 millimeters, which is most of the time also necessary in the uh, patients with AR, what we already discussed, that they have um, UCHA annually. And so I would like to illustrate the way uh, the valve is implanted um, with this uh, clinical case. It's an 84-year-old male patient uh, presented with a dyspnea, recent hospitalization due to decompensation. He was independent living. But of course, he is a typical patient. I think Henrik would not be so happy to operate on because he's 
84 years old. And you see here the echo, so a clear, severe aortic regurgitation, um, um, ejection fraction already mildly impaired. And so this is his CT scan, and uh, what you appreciate here is that the uh, ascending aorta um, is not really, um, I mean, in hugely enlarged, but of course we also see in some of the cases. But when you look at the perimeter measured down here, it was uh, almost 90, so if you calculate that to an uh, annulus uh, diameter, you end up being almost um, by, um, around 30 uh, millimeters. So this is a typical case um, where we, of course, would like to treat him interventionally, and with the system we have now available, there is uh, really this option. And so this is also what we decided for in our heart team. And now these are basically the steps of the implantation I would like to guide you through. So first step is the alignment of the locators. You uh, can nicely see that here on the right hand side. So the locators are placed here in, in, in every single um, a coronary cusp and the delivery system allows for very well uh, torqueability to really be able to achieve this um, position of the locators. And the second step is then, of course, you have to make sure that the locators are um, positioned correctly because you really have to be sure that the leaflets are grabbed because otherwise you do not have a secure uh, ceiling here. And so this is just done here. We currently do that with a multi-purpose catheter. And you see just the injection in the right and the left coronary sinus here. And we confirm that the locators are in a correct position. And then um, f the final positioning, just uh, you, if you check if you have to uh, get any deeper, you have a marker here on the delivery system. And when you check that, uh, then you are ready for valve release. Currently we do that under fast or rapid pacing and you see it's a very fast release. The valve is absolutely stable when you, um, when you open up um, the catheter here to release the valve. And so this is basically the result, uh, the uh, angiogram showing no AR, and here is the echo just two days uh, after the implantation, so very good result with only really, yeah, trace of PVL. And so this is just a case to illustrate uh, the way the valve works, but of course we are always keen to find out about the current data. And so we collected um, over the last few months since uh, Trilogy Valve was available, the data from the um, first 45 patients with AR we treated in five centers uh, over Germany. And I think the data is pretty amazing. I mean, Alexander Tam just presented this, uh, this afternoon in a late breaking uh, clinical trial session and you see technical success was a hundred percent there was no um, second valve uh, necessary no conversion to surgery a leery low rate of major complications so no stroke no in hospital mortality a great hemodynamics and um, I have to mention that the pacemaker was 23%. I think we should discuss this just uh, briefly. And when you look at the paravalvular leakage, I mean, it's really great that uh, only 9% had mild uh, PVL. All the others had none or trace. So to conclude, I think um, so far the data is pretty convincing, and we are happy to have the system available for patients I just presented to you. Thank you. Okay. Let, let's talk a little bit about this, this valve and, and the opportunity we have here to uh, treat this patient cohort. Um, 45 out of 45 technical success. You're, you're proctoring. Is it really that easy? I mean, I'm, I'm the youngest kid on the block. I've done five last week, and they all went perfectly well. It's amazing. I'm a fan. But um, I think we have to tell people how easy it is or difficult it is to... to place these three feelers at the corner. Yeah, I think it's an important point. Of course, it's a little bit different from implanting another system because you have the three locators. You have to be sure that they are in the correct place. But I mean, you are well trained um, just before the procedure and the, the handling of the delivery system. I think it's, it's very easy. Um, and then it's not uh, rocket science. I mean, we do mitral clip. I think this is much more a tricuspid clip. It's much more difficult than um, implanting uh, the trilogy valve. Yeah. So, of course, there is a learning curve. And I think for the beginning, it's good to do three or five cases in a row. But apart from that, it's uh, doable. Okay, Henning, 20% pacemaker rate. That in, sounds like, like, like a, a, a problem now. But... We're now looking at a cohort of patients that previously didn't have any 
treatment option. So what's the pacing rate in, in standard AR surgery? It's not so far away from that. So we have at least 10% pacemakers also in AR surgery. And, and we know from the other valve types, and Nicholas says, I could also comment on that, pacemaker rates are even higher if you use the Evolute or other valve types in that indication. So AR somehow seems to be a condition that is a bit prone from post-operative pacemaker implantation for whatever you do. And this is, of course, a drawback and 20% a bit high, but also we have to take into account small numbers. So maybe that looks different if we place like 200 or 500 valves and then let's have a look what the number will be. But Nicolas, wouldn't we expect anything like that looking at how the valve sits? Well, it, it is kind of deepish, right? You, you, have, you have a frame that might go a little bit deeper in the LVOT, but at the same time, I, I, I would agree with, uh, with Hendrik that um, again, it's a different animal, so you also have a different impact of the aortic regurgitation on the ventricle and on the LVOT. So you're stretching also the conducting conduction system, and that might make it more vulnerable to any kind of manipulation that you're doing. So again, I would agree that if there if there is otherwise no option. So I think uh, most patients <laughs> would definitely take the 20% pacemaker rate that we're seeing here, and obviously. Um, if we if we get if we get more and more insights uh, in those patients, we might also get better in uh, in reducing the pacemaker rates. Stefan, yeah, I would be optimistic that we can do better even here. I mean, we have seen uh, in in the early implantations in patients with aortic stenosis that pacemaker rates were exceptionally low, um, and here without calcium, we may actually do a, a, an implantation or use an implantation depth which is which is not. Uh, exclusively necessary, so we, we perhaps in, in the future can refrain I think from... To, to just uh, you know, say that again, in other words, um, this, this valve sits just perfectly deep, right, when, it, when, treated, uh, when, when aortic regurgitation is, is, is treated. The feelers are on the bottom of the sinuses and it comes up from, from below and there's about four millimeters, I think, uh, of, of expansion there. Um, and in a population that is prone to have AV block, uh, as they seem to be, I think 20% is, is, is expected. And again, this is a population that doesn't have any other uh, a treatment option. I think it's something that, that could be improved, maybe, but is not such a, a, a bad thing, after all. The interesting thing and that I want to finish in. There is a series with aortic stenosis because this valve works in aortic stenosis as well. And there, there is calcium and the feelers sit a bit higher and the valve is implanted a bit higher. Uh, in their first series reported, the pacing rate is zero, right? So it has to do with implantation depth and what kind of condition you're treating. Tanya. And then there was one other important um, observation we made that in this nine patients here receiving a new pacemaker, six out of them had already pre-existing conduction disturbances. So this is also surprising because, I mean, if you... I mean, it, it's it's much more, or the, the level is much higher than you would expect in AS patients. So it could easily be that, it, since it's a different animal, AR, as we all agreed on, that maybe the conduction system is somehow affected even before. So It, it fits with the dilation of the ventricle, right? You yeah. will see more uh, conduction disorders like left bundle branch if there is a dilated yeah. ventricle. And yeah, maybe there must yeah. also be some fibrous tissue and uh, yeah. having more impact. So maybe you should treat them earlier then. Okay, uh, the final round of discussion. Where, where do we go? Henning, how does aortic regurgitation treatment look in five years? Oh, well, I think uh, a couple of thoughts I'd like to share with you and discuss with you. The first is now we do have a dedicated treatment, and I think patients deserve to get that treatment and not we should, we should really step away from using uh, non uh, good uh, valve types and treating AR. So I know it's not easy because the valve is not always available tomorrow, but in a year from now it may look different. And I'd really love to see that every patient with POAR is being treated with this device and not with others anymore. And then we, we talked about the different animals several times. So when we speak about AR, it's much different to AS. Um, I think we should then also have some ideas about when to treat the patient. Somehow, my feeling is that we treat them at a very late stage. They are only, only be sent if they have not only severe AR, but also left ventricular dilatation to a 
degree that is maybe you know um, pretty much uh, enforced already. So if we now could start and and underline this with this with study in this regard at a very early time point when we have moderate to severe AR but not yet signs of LV dilatation, that might be a good idea to prevent um, uh, patients from getting that down that road. Would also have a positive impact on the pacemaker implantation rate, I think. And um, I would also go this far, and, and I'm a surgeon, so it, it hurts me a bit to say, but I think that is a valve where I could really imagine that TAVI as a first-line uh, treatment might be the best way to go. That has different aspects to it, especially due to the design of the valve. It's a very uh, small impact when it comes to a uh, nitronal stent. So it should be easy to explant if needed. It should be a good target for future TAV and TAV. Um, uh, from that perspective, I think that might be an idea. We could have treat patients earlier and treat them with TAVI first rather than surgery first. Let me, let me comment and then I'll, I'll let you uh, ask. There's, there's one more feature that we should actually comment on, and, and that is um, this valve is like a surgical valve, right? It's, it's naturally commissural aligned. And, and has open coronary arteries. So it's sort of a good first valve. Um, so if you talk about explantation, you, we probably just would put another one into, in, into that uh, in a lifetime management. Sorry, uh, you had a question. Yeah, I had a question, but you've basically answered it in the, in the meanwhile. I was just going to ask uh, if, you know, if the AR patients are going to be intervened earlier, they might be younger, they might need a second valve. Is this valve developed, is this prosthesis developed with an idea of putting a second prosthesis? <laughs> I read your mind. <laughs> <laughs> Please come to the microphone. This is on the web, so you need to speak to the microphone so that everybody hears the question. Okay. So if a patient also has aortic root dilatation, which is a surgical indication, but he's a very high risk patient for Bental, for example, are those patients included in the studies that were done? And is there a protection or an ad additional risk for those patients? Henning, do you know that? They have not been included in the studies, but I think you can still treat them. It's all about the annulus size. Um, it's not uh, of importance how large the sinuses are. So you can still implant the valve as long as the annulus does not uh, exceed 30 millimeters. And there is a school of thinking that if you treat the valve, the progression of the dilation might slow down. So I, I think it does make sense in very high-risk patients to leave that dilated aorta alone and focus on the valve because you would have a less invasive uh, treatment option. Thank you. Um, I was involved in the transapical version of uh, Enovalve a couple of years ago. I was, I'm an interventional cardiologist. I implanted it with my friend and colleague from surgery. And we had the problem that some patients had um, dissections of the aortic root. Um, is it the problem that the surgeon was implanting it? And now uh, you don't have it because uh, it's, it's the interventional cardiologist or is, I, is I there a new feature one. on this valve? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I wonder who should answer that. <laughs> Do we have to expect that uh, in, a, in a larger series, or uh, is, it, is, it, is this problem now solved? No, that, that was a completely different valve at the time. So it's not the same valve anymore. And if you compare that stent design from the tensipical version of that valve with what we have today, it's totally different. Also, the, the locators are covered. And, and therefore, the risk of really hurting or um, rupturing uh, the native uh, tissue is basically zero. So I don't see this coming, and it's a, it's a history uh, story. And implantation technique has changed as well. Yeah. We are not starting so high, so that we're basically within um, the commissures starting to position the locators, which minimizes this as well. I think, so I think there's, there's more than 100 patients now, AR and AS, and, and, and ongoing trial in the US, we haven't mentioned, um, and, and that hasn't been an issue. So, uh, Just a question about the AS cohort of patients, because you suggested we should TAVI first and then maybe TAVI and TAVI rather than... Lifetime AVR, management, yeah. Rather than AVR first. Um, the, the important point to make here, I think, if we're going to do that, whether we need to get really surgical-like results on the first implant because it will be in younger patients. So what are the PVL rates for this specific valve when we treat patients with aortic stenosis? Because of course you're not going to get any PVL for these patients because there is no calcium. Yeah. And what, what is the data for your typical 
patients with severe aortic stenosis. Because as, you, as just to make the point again, that we really need to be aiming as we move to lower risk patients to get surgical right results. So personally, my practice, I don't accept anything more than mild, and even in the younger patients, I wouldn't have accepted that. So what are the data for this? No, you're, you're quite right. Uh, have you got the data of? The, the, the data on aortic, paravalvular aortic regurgitation are ext extremely low. About in, in, 2%, AS. In, AS, yeah. in AS. About 2%. Um, I think, I think the idea of maybe just can comment on that because um, it's uh, his did, data, so with Mati, cool. yeah. So um, <laughs> it's uh, it's it's a little bit lower than that. So there was no moderate or severe AR, and there was uh, uh, eighty-six percent, I think, none or trace, and uh, the rest mild. So it's quite comparable to that. Yeah, and that is in patients. There's no excessive calcified lesions, uh, stenosis in there. It's it's moderate, the most uh, calcium in the aortic stenosis. Is that correct? We had no. It's a really it was a really calcified. So it had um, there are only uh, data from some centers with the Agatson score, but it's uh, it was above three thousand. So it's okay. uh, wow. really uh, these were really calcified valves, really um, um, uh, severe stenosis, uh, and uh, in these patients we have um, roughly the same results with the uh, in the AR um, cohort. So thank you. Does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, yeah, it does. Thank you. So, you know, we, we didn't intend to speak about aortic stenosis, but now that we have, it's, it's used in aortic stenosis as well, and the initial data look good, and, and um, you know, the commercial alignment and access to coronaries is, is definitely a benefit. Um, thank you for the uh, very comprehensive introduction to uh, how we, we could use Tavi in AR. I was uh, amongst many of you guys as well uh, in the audience years ago when uh, could be a presented his first case during the live course, as well as uh, the case they coded when uh, Colombo was doing it. So I think Tavi has come quite a, a long, uh, long uh, journey. And uh, I have a, I need a, an opinion from the panel, perhaps. Um, I have an 80-year-old guy. I don't think he can wait six months for his uh, valve replacement. Uh, his creatinine is 300. Uh, he's one year out from two spontaneous episodes of uh, subdural hemorrhage. So maybe uh, I could ask, um, what, what can I do for him? Thank you. So he's got severe AR and no calcium? or uh, The calcium level is not very high. Uh, annulus, I think it's on the higher side. Yep. Tanya? Then we should screen him for a trilogy implantation. <laughs> uh, he, I, he can't wait six months, so I, I don't think so. Yeah. I'm from Singapore. Yep. All right. Send him over. <laughs> 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 um, the Tavi guy in my group, of course, uh, is very uh, uh, courageous of thinking use, uh, of, of using the current devices. But uh, given what was presented, I guess uh, you know I, I need to put up put put the, the facts to the family and uh, make sure yeah. that they understand yeah. uh, what an option what should be the correct option. At this I think point. I think valve size really is important here. So a large valve is a pretty abstract. You really need to come with numbers, and then I really I I would for instance, if the valve area is less than 450, I would feel comfortable using an accurate valve in that particular situation. Sure. Obviously, the accurate valve is not designed for aortic regurgitation, but you mentioned that there is some calcium, and in smaller valves, there are a small series with pretty good results using the accurate valve. So if, that, if, if the accurate valve would be uh, available in your site or in Singapore, I would recommend that. And for his... Uh CKD problem, um, would you consider uh, treating potential coronary disease separately? Um, you know, I mean, the surgeon does that's like to fix everything at one shot, right? Well, that, that, that's, that's another matter of debate, right? In an 80-year-old, do you need to treat coronary concomitant coronary artery disease? There is a randomized controlled trial from the UK where they, where they mention that there is no benefit, no clinical benefit, net clinical benefit in treating the coronaries, and there's only a bleeding penalty. Mm -hmm. So I think in this particular case, I would focus on the aortic stenosis, unless it's a left main or a proximal yeah. LED. Happy with this consultation? Surgeon? <laughs> Are you Same happy you? with this consultation? I was saying. <laughs> right, so I think you. we can take this offline and discuss the patient in more detail if you like uh, and see what options there are. Um, I do think we come to the end of the allocated time. And um, 
if there are no further comments, I'll just wrap it up and, and, and summarize what we've said. Um, I think we've established that AR, we frequently didn't really look hard enough to see that the patients are, are, are not uh, getting a good deal. AR is relevant, uh, it's out there, and there are a lot of patients that are currently not well treated with our uh, established interventional treatments um, if they can't have surgery. Uh, there is a new valve, uh, the Trilogy. Um, the initial results are very good, I would say. Uh, they are good for AR, but they are also good for aortic stenosis. So I think we will see much more of this uh, device and will establish uh, treatment pathways, I'm sure, that include it. Um, thanks to the panel, and thanks to Yenawal for hosting this symposium, and have a nice evening. Bye.